All right. Uh, we are in the Gospel of Luke as we head toward Easter this year. And uh, today there was this large swath of Luke available to us. And uh, I was super stoked because my absolute favorite, one of my absolute favorite parables that Jesus tells was in this section. So I thought I would preach something completely different. No, I'm going to... I'm going to share with you this, uh, this uh, one of my favorite. I don't know why it's my favorite. I, I, it's just, it just always has jumped out, spoken to me. So uh, I'm excited to get to share it with you today. So hear this God's word out of Luke chapter 18. We're going to start at verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers and evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector, he stood at a distance and he would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us your word and, and the ways that you speak to us and you poke at us. And, and uh, you know, now that I think about it, Father, I think... Probably the reason that this parable is one of my favorites is that it pokes at me. You know my heart. You know the struggles with arrogance and, and pride and, and, I don't know, cockiness that I have lived with. And I thank you that you say these things um, partly to kind of get underneath that and to call it out, but also to bless me. So bless us with your word. Bless us with what this means and how we can understand it and apply it to our own lives. We ask this, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Jesus is hanging out with his disciples. We find that out at the beginning of chapter 18. He's hanging out with his disciples. He's hanging out with his disciples. And he tells them some parables. This is the time he's talking about. He's teaching them some things. Here are some parables. Parables, made up stories to teach a lesson. And he starts by telling them a parable about a persistent widow. She keeps knocking on the door of a judge, wanting justice, and she won't give up until she gets it. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this. Now, I want us to pay attention to the fact that who's he talking to? His disciples. Thank you. We need to know that because as he goes on, as he tells another story to teach another lesson, it would be really easy for us to think, oh, he must be talking to the Pharisees that are listening. He must be talking to the tax collectors that might be overhearing. He might be talking to the people who are the, the, the characters in his story because, you know, there's a, a lesson that he needs to teach them. But he's talking to his disciples because Amongst his disciples were some people, were some disciples who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. That's his audience. That's who he's talking to. That's who needs to hear what he has to say in this made-up story to teach a lesson. People who believe in him, who follow him, and who think that they're better than others. People who spend energy and effort and capacity and time and emotion, they spend thought figuring out how they stand in comparison to other people. Which, I mean, I, let's be honest, would anyone in here say they don't struggle with that from time to time? Like I'm actually waiting for hands to go. No. We know that. This is a, a human condition. We think of who we are. We can't help but wonder who we are in light of who the people around us are. And, and it's not always a negative. I mean, we got to keep up with the Joneses. That's like the worst part. Oh, they got a jet ski. I got to have a jet ski. Oh, they got a new truck. I'm going to get one of those lightnings, and that'll show them, right? That's the keep up with the Joneses. But it's, it doesn't have to be that negative and that destructive. It can be uh, simple things. Wow, I wish my kids were as good at sports as their kids. Or, or oh, I wish I could retire as early as 
some people who retire early. I wish I was as good a preacher as some other people. I wish I, wish I could take a better care of my house. Did you see how so-and-so took care of their house when we were over there the other day? It was so clean. It's gorgeous. And I really should do better. And we, we, we look at other people's lives, and then we wonder about our own. And it's this weird thing, and it sneaks in. It, you, sometimes you don't even notice it. Um, as I was, I was preparing for today, uh, I suddenly, I, I was reminded of, of one of these times that I have done this. Um, in the time I've owned my truck, I bought it in 2017. In the time I've owned my truck, which I still own and still drive, Pastor Trent has driven three different vehicles. That, now, that's not a qualitative statement. That's not he, he, bad or good or anything like that. It's a statement of fact. But why do I know that? Why do I care? Because I'm a car guy, and when I was growing up, my grandpa had a new vehicle every two years. And I always thought to myself, I'd really love a new vehicle every two years, just like grandpa. Of course, then I'm comparing myself to my grandfather. Why am I comparing myself to my grandfather? What does that have to do with who I am and what I'm called to do, who I'm supposed to be today, right now? What does that have to do with any of it? It, it, it sneaks in. It, it can be super insidious. And it can end up making us, encouraging us, influencing us to make decisions that end up hurting us. I could, I could spend a lot of my life in debt trying to attain something that somebody else is doing but might not be God's plan for me. It can seem innocuous. It can seem, it's a very sneaky way of leading into discontent. And, and, and to those who spent their time in relational comparison, Jesus tells a made-up story to teach them a lesson. He teaches them and speaks to them in a parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I, give, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. And the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. As Jesus begins this story, his audience, his disciples, the people listening to him, he is starting to paint a picture. He's creating a story. And we all know what happens when somebody starts telling a story. We automatically begin kind of figuring out what are the parameters, what are the rules, who's the, who, who are the characters. And as Jesus is laying this out, okay, once upon a time, there was a Pharisee and a tax collector. The people listening to him in that moment, they're already like, okay, so this is a story about a good guy and a bad guy. Now we know what the good guy, we, we know who the good guy is, and we know who the bad guy is. And so now, what about what the good guy is doing? Are we learning so that we can do it? And what is the bad guy doing so we know we can avoid it? This is the premise of the story. Everybody's automatically making assumptions. If this was a Western, we know who the guy wearing the white hat is, and we know who the guy wearing the black hat is. Jesus begins this way on purpose. He wants to lead his hearers along so, so, so they, they can wrestle with their assumptions, wrestle with what they're hearing. The Pharisee is the good guy to the people listening that day. Now, I know that's tough for us because we've heard it over and over again with 2,000 years of New Testament study and perspective over and over again. We hear about hypocrisy and hard-heartedness, the whitewashed tombs of the Pharisees. In some ways, we come at a disadvantage to this passage because to us, the Pharisees are kind of a New Testament boogeyman. They're the bad guys, but no, not to the people Jesus is talking to. They're the good guys. But Jesus was tough on them and they treated, because of how they treated the least of these. Yes, yes, we know that. But for that audience who grew up in that culture, the Pharisees were the people you admired. They were the faithful church people of the day. They weren't like the other Jewish uh, segments of society who were a little bit dangerous and off kilter. And they weren't like the non-Jewish people or, or, or even like the half-Jewish people. You know, they weren't like the zealots who, who wanted to go to war to claim the power of, of God's 
kingdom and, and presence on this earth and let's just take a sword and cut everybody up that doesn't believe. They weren't the zealots. The Pharisees were good church people. They, they, were, they were peaceful. But they wanted to just be faithful. And they weren't like the, the Sadducees who were just the politicians who were always compromising to just keep the peace all the time. No, they weren't, they weren't Jewish like that. They were faithful. They hung on to God's word and they wanted everybody to hang on to God's word. They weren't, they weren't like the Samaritans who were like these half Jewish and half not Jewish. And like, that's a big mess. So let's not even talk about them. We don't even want to look at them. And they're not like the Romans who are pagans. And that, that's a bad word now. But back then, that's just the religion of multiple gods. They were pagans. And they're not like Gentiles who just, like, we don't even know what they believe. They're the Pharisees. They're the faithful ones. They're the ones who, they're, they're, you would send your kids to play with their kids. Like, you wanted that. They were the role models. Like, if there were, tra- if there were like, religious trading cards, you would want the Pharisee ones. Like, they would be the power ones in the Pokemon set. Because they studied the scriptures and they memorized God's word and people liked them and they respected them and they wanted to be like them. Yeah, you know what? They have a little bit of a hard edge to them, but that's what you want when you're in the battle between the godless world and God's truth. You want people who will not waver nor fail to keep what's most important the most important. And that's how people thought of the Pharisees. That's who they were in that society. They're the good guys. To that audience. And then, well, I mean, what that means is we know who the bad guy is, right? It's the tax collector. And for all the reasons you've heard a thousand times in all the sermons where anybody's ever talked about tax collectors, they're the bad guys because they stole from their own people to line their own pockets. They would align with Rome and Rome's oppression for their own benefit. You would not let your kids play with a tax collector's kid. It would be a bad influence. Everybody would look at you cross-eyed. They weren't the role models for the people of that society. They were users and manipulators and liars and thieves. So as Jesus is making up a story, once upon a time, there was a good guy and a bad guy. And the people are like, okay, so here's a story. Which one of these guys is, Jesus, is, is God going to bless? They're in the temple and they're praying. Which one will receive blessings from God? Which one is due blessings from God? Jesus sets it up. He sets it up. And you know, if, if, if he's talking to his disciples and in this moment there's someone in there who just loves to be that person that spoils the end of the movie. Hey, did you see that movie? I haven't seen it yet. Oh, you should see it. The ending is this. Like, there's that person out there, like, they, they're hearing Jesus set the story up, and they want to jump in and go, yeah, the Pharisee, like, he won, right? <laughs> but Jesus doesn't even wait. He doesn't, he doesn't wait for somebody to jump in. He, pay, he lays down the foundation. He lays the story down. There's a good guy and the bad guy, and the good guy is talking about, like, all the ways that he's super good. Like, he's got the bona fides. He's got the proof, right? Not only does, like, fasting twice a week, that's, like, more than you're supposed to. And a tenth off of all you get, like, m- most people kind of fudged it a little bit, so he was really faithful in his giving to the church. He's got it. He's got it all going on. And there's a tax collector, and the tax collector knows just how bad he is. Jesus sets this up. Which one will God bless? And it's in this moment Jesus just zooms in with the answer before anybody can speak up. He tells them what's going on. Which one of these guys will God bless? Well, guess what? It's not the one you think. Why? And this is where I kind of wonder if, he, uh, if he's actually thinking of a 1 Samuel passage. 1 Samuel 16 says this, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He's like, what's going on inside of these people reveals, what they're praying reveals so much about what's going on inside of them, about their real relationship with God. One of the characters in the story, the Pharisees, acting so much like the people that Jesus is speaking to. You know, the ones who thought they were better than others.
Because the Pharisee, like the people Jesus is speaking to, only understood who he was based on what was true about other people. It's almost like he spent his life and he got his identity off of what it was like to look out a window at the lives of other created human beings. And what he sees around him doesn't measure up to his own standards and doesn't measure up to what he thinks God's standards should be. And so he feels pretty good about himself. His identity is based on everybody else, right? And then when he talks to God, he's not really actually talking to God. I mean, look at this prayer. Is this really talking to God? I, 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 ain't I great, admire me, I'm showing off. And he puts other people down in order to raise himself up. Lord, aren't I impressive? Is that really a prayer to the Lord? And then there's this other person in the room, the tax collector, and, and suddenly the reality of this jumps out, the juxtaposition, the comparison between the two. Jesus is flipping, flipping the script about what sets him apart. Tax collector isn't even looking up. He's not making grand statements, trying to show off. He's not trying to win God's approval. He is absolutely confident in only one thing. He is a fallen man. He doesn't measure himself against other people. In fact, when it, when it comes to understanding his identity, he seems to only understand himself by what he sees reflected from God. He knows who he is because he... Because he knows what God expects and who God is. He knows what God says. He's looking in the mirror of God's face to see what's true. Instead of looking out the window to see what other people are thinking, other people are doing, other people are, yeah. And what he sees in the mirror of God's face breaks his heart And mercy is the only plea he's got. And then it's it's almost like, (laughs) I don't know if you you caught this in their prayers. Uh, And I I don't think Jesus missed this. I think he knew exactly what was going on. But both of these characters that that Jesus is is writing the script for, both of them in this story, both of them get exactly what they pray for. The Pharisee didn't ask for anything. And so he got nothing. And the tax collector asks for mercy. And he goes home justified. Both men needed mercy. And only one went home with it. A lot of folks, when... They come across this scripture. A lot of folks, when they read this parable, they see in it the juxtaposition between pride and humility. And I want to I want to acknowledge that, and I want to make sure that you're catching what it really says about pride and humility. Because so often the really easy read is if you're prideful, if you puff yourself up, you're in the wrong. And if you're humble, if you kind of get that worm theology, then you're doing good. But that's not what real humility is. Or real pride. Real pride is when you're looking at everyone else and comparing yourself and you're thinking really well of yourself. Pride is also if you're looking at everybody else and you're thinking really poorly about yourself because what you're allowing to happen is your definition of your identity is defined by every other created person out there. That is the sin of pride. It is a juxtaposition. It's looking out saying, I... I, I can't measure up to that, or I measure up even better. That's, that's not what's going on. And real humility is not that West Michigan humility where we're like, oh, shucks, I, don't, I, I can't do anything good. <laughs> you know, that's not actual humility. Real humility is looking at the face of God and saying, all right, I know exactly what I am in your eyes. I know, I know how I don't measure up, but I also know how you've blessed me, and I know how you have gifted me, and I know what you've called me to do. If somebody is an outstanding communicator because God has gifted them, they're like, you know what? God has given me this gift to communicate, and so I'm going to do all of it as much as I can because that's what God says I should do. That person is not prideful. They're humble because they're humbly living into exactly what God made them to be. That's why it's not a prideful moment when Paul says to the church, 
Live this faith like I do. That's not pride. So don't don't put that on yourself. I know it's a cultural thing that we all have to struggle with. Uh, Don't put it on yourself. I love this parable. I love it because it reminds me every single day to pay attention to where I look for my identity. Where I look for my value. Where I look for the truth of who I am. And when I spend my life looking out through the window at other human beings to get a sense of what's supposed to be true, then reality gets skewed and exaltation and righteousness is harder to find. It's far away. But when I stand as I am before God, when we stand where we are before God and we let God's face be the mirror by which we see our souls, then the truth is not far from us. That's where real reality is found. If we just simply allow him to tell us who we are, what he reveals in us, our sin, our blessings, all of these things will be on the table. And then also, because we know we're seeing in God's face the truth, we will also see the grace allowed us, poured out on us in Jesus Christ. And it will consume our brokenness and empower the things that he has in mind for us. And we will walk exalted and righteous in his sight. Praise be to God. I love this parable. I love this parable. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you. Thank you so much for challenging us. Jesus, uh, for coming up with with examples and stories and, and ways of cutting through the the baloney that we often believe and the things that we think and the truths that we make up and reveal to us where we turn for our identity. Reveal to us if we believe lies, if we're looking out the window to know who we are and what we're supposed to do, or if we're looking into the mirror of God's face. Convict us where we are looking incorrectly and encourage us as we as we seek you thank you in your precious name lord jesus we pray amen